Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So who's in charge and who's responsible for this whole thing? It's a good question, isn't it? Especially nowadays, who actually is in charge? It's kind of hard to, uh, to tell those who are supposed to be in charge with the designated offices are fallen by the wayside in many cases. Our so-called leaders can't trust any of them the world over, actually. Local or federal or state matters not, seems like. And exactly what is it that must be taken charge over? With what kind of authority? Need to ask yourself these things, huh? Who exactly bestowed this authority and to whom is it bestowed? We don't often think of these things, you know, we just go on with life and it's, okay, I know what to do here and I know this and that and so forth and so on, but all these things are important questions. And of course, a short answer is life. Your very lives. So who's in charge of your life? Are you in charge of your life? No. Is it God? Yes. Is it the devil? No. <coughs> Is it our jobs, our professions to earn a living? Is it our peers? Sometimes our peers need to be satisfied, up to a point anyway. So they're, they are part of our lives. Is it the government? which has charge over our life. They certainly seek to, don't they? So along with this business of being in charge or not comes the question of who is responsible. Who is responsible for your life? Have you all thought about that nice and deep? God, obviously, is the overall highest judge who is in charge, but he's given us all responsibility, didn't he? You're responsible for your sin, I'm responsible for mine, as well as everything good we might do. The state certainly wants to rule <coughs> excuse me, over you, as we've seen in the last three years, more so than ever before, and there's no sign of stopping that. Things are being rolled out, even as we speak that are going to be made public not too long from now, that are going to have new stipulations on those who are over us, and therefore us. <clears throat> These two important aspects, authority of being in charge and the accompanying responsibility cannot be separated. You can't separate those things. Who's in charge? I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. <laughs> you know. How about, I'll take responsibility. They won't say that. It's just, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. Nobody wants to take responsibility, right? And yet they work together. They're two sides of the same coin. These things cannot be separated. If you're going to take charge, you must take responsibility because it automatically accompanies it. And so a big part of this is to understand and manage our lives with this knowledge <coughs> of what it means to be in charge. If you want to be a boss, if you want to be a CEO, if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be a leader, if you want to be a parent, if you want to be any of those things, and to be in charge, you've got to take this. You've got to take the responsibility. And that's maybe one of my big things today is to make sure we keep reminding ourselves of that and maybe learn it for the first time. And all of this is to establish a harmonious outcome in personal relationships. Don't you want your personal relationship with the Lord to be harmonious? How about with your siblings? How about with your parents? How about with your children? How about with your neighbors and your friends? I mean, that is the ultimate, isn't it? And of course, this is where it can get sticky. Because in today's world, <coughs> we're all told to be tolerant. And we've preached on this for years. The tolerance is not what tolerance really means. 
it is one thing to claim to be calm, cool, and collected when dealing with wrong and asinine things that happen before our very eyes, especially when some form of perversion raises its ugly head. That, that's one thing, and it's another, quite another, actually, when we're expected to not only go along with these perversions, but to approve of them as well. And this is where we live. we got to approve of everything that's, that's being headlined above our heads by the powers that be. So they say, but you and I can't do that because our place uh, to go to is the Word of God. Our truth is God and His Word. And once that gets trashed, then we have nothing that we can agree with. I can only agree with God's Word. Anything that comes against God's Word, I will not agree with. We have to put a wrench in that perverted mechanism. Of course, what the world perverts, they don't call it that. They call it advancement. They call it a new idea, a new thing, a new invention. It's easy. See, all you got to do is go, it's easy. Apparently, Elon Musk has come out, and they're going to announce it soon with his new phone. Completely different from all other phones and make up the material, the material used. There are no cutouts, you know, for push buttons or any of that. No, the cameras are different, high, totally, totally advanced camera system. In fact, four different advancements in cameras in uh, fixations and, you know, wide shots, well, all that stuff. I mean, just crazy stuff. It just doesn't seem to stop. <coughs> And it's all sold as being bigger and better, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so who takes the responsibility for this charge of these new things that are coming to us? And you're all going to be, uh, uh, you know, part of it. I am too. We are already being controlled by AI, by, by this. This is AI. Our phones are AI. Everything's AI. When we go to the grocery store, it's AI. But all of this, our true blue love that we saints, we holy ones, are to live our lives by shines the most. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, let your light so shine that everyone sees it. And you know the children's song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. What does that mean? It means I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb, and I'm going to let it shine, I'm going to tell people about it. While he prayed about us being ambassadors for the Lord, that's exactly what we are and the jobs that lay before us in this life. Our own feelings or comfort or peace of mind will at some point get trashed in whatever situation we may find ourselves in. And in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 7, <coughs> the Apostle Paul tells us just to, it's better to put up with some nonsense from, from, a, <coughs> excuse me, from a brother or sister, rather than go to the world and have this thing worked out. We can't go to the world. Paul says, why don't you just take it? Just put up with it, no matter how bad it gets for you. That's better than you taking it to the world, because what is the world going to do? They're godless. Paul says that going to the world to settle matters among believers is so bad that we are better off just letting ourselves be cheated and wronged somehow. That's a hard one for most of us, especially where it concerns business. We've been there, and we've done that several times. But what we must never forget is that the Lord knows it all. He knows who cheated whom. He knows who did what to whom, however, when and how and all that. <coughs> and being uncompromisingly just, he won't just let it go. He will right the wrong, but he'll do it in his timing and in his way. While well, you and I remain calm, cool, and collected, trusting that very thing. Does that make sense? It does, doesn't it? It's hard sometimes. I'm here to tell you it's hard. But it's true. 
because most of our squabbles, even among saints, if we're honest, are usually selfish at the core. We're all selfish. We want what we want. So who's in charge <coughs> of me, of you, of this body of believers, of human society at large? Who's in charge? See, true leaders can only be and lead all those who have taken personal responsibility. Try to lead somebody who's taken no personal responsibility. You won't get the job done. That's what they call lazy people, low life, people who just don't care. They want a paycheck, but they don't want to do anything. And today's government is willing to give them that and is doing it. This is how far we've slipped as a society. The Bible is crystal clear on who owns everything and everyone. Almighty God owns everything and everyone. The earth is owned by God, the saint is owned by God, and even the sinner is, in fact, owned by God. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 is very clear. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof that leaves nothing out. And yet, unbeknownst to them, <coughs> unbeknownst to most people, actually, the impenitent sinner... Hardcore, doesn't want the Lord, doesn't want anything to do with the Lord, turns his back on the Lord every chance they get. They're still owned by God. They don't know that, but God knows it. However, they're not recognized by him as his children. And he is master of all, but father only to his children, that is believers. Don't think of children as little kids whenever you read children in the Bible. There's only one instance where, you know, where it says, uh, let the little children be, don't mess with them, Jesus said, you know, for such as these are the, is the kingdom of God. That place, yes. But everywhere else you see children of God, it's talking about adults, it's talking about believers. Any believer of any age, but it's talking about believers, not just little ones. It's the same meaning as the children of Israel. It's not talking about a bunch of little kids that belong to Israel. It's talking about all those who believe in God. Members of the household, family members is what that refers to. See, everything is owned by someone, and the Lord is owner of everything. And the world nowadays tells us they're going to be owners of everything, and we're not going to own nothing, and we're going to like it, right? You know, this has been so advertised lately. And yet God, and that, among many things, <coughs> that trashes one of the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not steal. That is an ownership commandment, private property commandment, to protect ownership and private property. And they're trashing that, but we know they will. But you and I still know who owns everything and what he's done for us and what he's given us. So understanding to whom we actually belong as a true possession is essential. We have to know to whom we belong. And only with this understanding in place can it be understood what our part is in all this. There is a reason we have a definitive part to play in this life. Whatever age we are, we have a part to play in this life. And it starts with obedience to God. And that's shown by obedience to parents, no matter how old the kids are. No choice, no part to play. We've been given the power of choice. If we had no choice, we'd just be servants, robots. In contrast, a saint is a bona fide family member. As a believer in God, you belong to his family. We all do. This is the most wonderful thing. And as such, God protects us like a family member. But he won't cuddle us. Uh, are you feeling bad today? Uh. If you want to feel better, trust me. You're going to be attacked in this world. You're going to be 
screwed over in this world, to put it bluntly. But I know about it already. I know who's doing what to whom, and I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance is mine. Woo! And in that we trust. You know, God gave us something he himself doesn't have. We've talked about it in the past. I want to reiterate it today, and that's the power of contrary choice. You, uh, you and I can choose contrary to our better knowledge. We can choose against ourselves. God can't do that because 2 Timothy 2.13 says he can't deny himself. You and I can deny ourselves. Sounds stupid, doesn't it? But we can do it, and many people do do just that. <coughs> it's a good thing the Lord is loyally true blue to himself, to his attributes, and to all his promises to his human creatures who bear his image. That's awesome. That's you and me. Ow! I've been made in the image of God, and so were you. That's right. And he upholds that in us, for us, through us, in the way he directs our lives. And he's written down how we should be leading our lives according to his word. But we can deny ourselves and we do it in various ways. And one of which is when we fail to take responsibility. Because we have a choice in this. We don't have to take this. I mean, we do if we want things right. If we really want to be in charge, we have to take this. If we don't want to be in charge, we don't have to take this. The problem with humanity is people don't want this, but they think they're in charge. We see this all the time, especially with our so-called leaders. When we pretend that we're out of the picture, when it's obvious that we're clearly not, it's another way. <coughs> How, saints, we actually have the power to choose against ourselves. And look at the amount of people who choose against themselves by trashing the Lord. We were created in God's image, were we not? Yes. Yeah. And the power to freely choose any side that daily comes our way, were we not? Yes. And which presents itself as a possible solution to what needs to happen in the flow of life. Here's where the concept of plausibility comes in as well. This is a major tool of the enemy. If you're not sure about something, the enemy will make sure that in your mind, you begin to think there's a plausibility of things going good, of things working out, of this is the right choice, when it's totally the wrong choice. Well, it's plausible... <clears throat> those who absolutely do not want to admit that God created everything will say something stupid like, well, evolution is plausible. They know it isn't. There's no plausibility at all. So it comes down to desires, something desired, even if wrong, but something that can demonstrate a fair plausibility in our minds of being this good thing will probably be the force in the decision we finally make, but we make the decision. And that's where the responsibility comes in. If our decisions are wrong, if our decisions are detrimental to our own well-being, we will pay the price. There's no pulling us out of that particular ring of fire. Because we made that choice, we have to deal with a consequence. Remember, consequence is with sequence. There's a sequence that follows everything. With sequence, consequence, consequence. It follows whatever we choose. You know, whatever follows... When I choose to eat some nice crisp bacon, joy in my belly. That's what follows. 
Ja. ja. <laughs> you know what follows when, when it's all nasty and sad and full of mud? No joy. Those are consequences. <laughs> we can't help but have them. <coughs> so being in charge and handling the responsibility <coughs> of said charge, excuse me, are different animals, albeit they are nevertheless the same species. God Almighty owns us, and I, for one, am thankful for that. And you and I are given the responsibility of personally steering your life. Think of your life as being a vehicle, and you're driving. You're in the driver's seat, you got your hand on the wheel, and you can choose the brake, you can choose the gas pedal, you can choose the gear. You can choose the road in which you go, or go straight or turn. You can choose to go up a hill or roll down a hill, take a curve, or you can choose to go around in circles. All of that's your choice. God says, that's okay. If you want to be a circle driver, never get anywhere, go for it. And that'll produce a consequence. Want it. There's something called circular reasoning where people will do this. They have no answer. But the answer that they give leads back to the question. That leads back to the circle, and it keeps on going in a circle. There's no answer. It just keeps going around, around, around. And you stay in ignorance that way. See, there's this reason <coughs> why, even though God is our master, we're personally responsible for sin in our lives. This is why he gave us choice. We can't blame God or anyone or anything else for our sin. It's our problem. And while God is ultimately in charge, we have our part to play to be obedient to his word is number one. And that contains all the instructions for everything with which we could possibly have to deal with in this life. When you're young'uns like these front row right here, the dealings in your life is what am I going to eat? What am I going to do at school? What am I going to play? When am I going to put this money Where are my buddies? That's right, exactly. When you get a little older, it's more like I got to pay the rent. <laughs> I got to make money to make a car payment. I got to keep my insurance up. I got to see a doctor here and there. And you get older. Oh, now I have kids. I got all that stuff to think about. And then when you get really old, I got to think about trying to make it from this room to that room without falling. It's amazing, isn't it? But that's how it works. We all know it. So we're to be true blue to him, his word, firstly, then to our true fellow saints, and then to our neighbors at large. That's what the Lord demands from all of us. He demands it. He doesn't ask it. He doesn't pretty, pretty please. He demands it. Why would he demand it? Because he knows the consequences of not doing it are to our detriment. He doesn't want you to be in a sad shape. He doesn't want you to be you know, having to cry and woe is me and all that. But many times we do that because of what we choose to do with what lays in front of us. God Almighty is the highest judge, hallelujah, and will hold everyone <coughs> responsible from everywhere. And he's already appointed a day for this judgment, Acts 17, 31. He's appointed a day and he's proven that he appointed the day the writer of Acts says, because he raised Christ from the dead. Woo! Mm -hmm. That resurrection proves there'll be a judgment day. All those who think they're going to get away without being judged by God, already too late, Christ already came out of the grave. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, hallelujah, as our Melchizedekian type judge. 
prophet, priest, and king. Woo! I love it. So who's in charge and whose responsibility is it? <coughs> well, Jesus, our master, is in charge. And he's empowered us with the responsibility of our own conduct through the span of life. How do you conduct yourself every day? How do I conduct myself, right? This is all a reminder to let us know that we must conduct ourselves as if we were Jesus. The Bible says he never reviled, he never, you know, went into one. When he did get upset, when he turned over the money changers' tables, totally just. When he said, you guys are of your father the devil, totally just. We say those things just because we're mad. And we just have to get one in, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. So corporately, the Lord has given humanity the responsibility. And personally, we each have to take it on. What happened in this, since 2019, 2020, 2021, and this year? To the majority of people in the world, they were complicit and they were compliant to what things were uh, coming down the pike. And that's why it worked for the powers that be. See? Those who shirk their assigned responsibility have chosen freely to be punished in this life for sure. And if it goes far enough in the next as well. Don't shirk your responsibilities, whatever they are right now. Yeah, I can't shirk mine. Oh, we complain there are mitigating circumstances many times. <coughs> Clouds the issue, you know, didn't really know. So we convince ourselves with the help of the enemy, of course, that it somehow wasn't or isn't our fault. You know, this plausibility thing. It's plausible, isn't it, God, for me to think that it really wasn't me? And God says, yeah, but I've already listed what you should do in that circumstance. <laughs> Just trust me, first of all. Do what's right. Have just weights. Deal justly with everyone. Check that and see if you didn't make a mistake. Yeah. <coughs> there goes my plausibility excuse. Now, obviously, this is fact. We do this. And it's also why God expects, especially the saints, to take it like a man. Even though we're getting screwed over, disrespected, unrecognized, ill-treated, etc., etc., etc. Take it like a man, he says, stand therefore, not <coughs> in faith. And when you stand in faith with your helmet and your shield and your breastplate and all the rest and your sword and your girdle, that is your belt. It's German for belt, by the way, not some woman's thing. <laughs> When you do that, you are doing God's will. When you do that, you're following God's directives. And when you do that, you'll know what to do next, that which is right. It's all part of our faith being tested. James 1, 2, and 3 says, don't bother, your faith is tested. Don't let it bother you. It's okay. It's got to be tested. And Mark 4, 14 and 15 talks about how the, the <coughs> enemy comes and steals the faith that was sown in your soil. And if you pass the test, the enemy can't steal it. Are you listening to me? Good. God knows what the truth is in any and all situations. And in case of us being hosed somehow, he will repay. And he'll do it on our personal behalf. See, this is what we sometimes don't think. We don't think God is really personal. Oh, we know it is. I got a personal relationship with Jesus. I'm saved. I'm born again. Blah, blah, blah. 
But really, in our lives, everyday life, with our business and everything else, we God's out there somewhere in the distance, isn't he? And we got to keep him close to us. We got to keep him close to us. That's our job. Paul says in Acts that he's near to everyone. God is in the hopes that we would grope for him. If he were far away, the groping wouldn't make sense. You guys, if you all shut your eyes, you could only grope for me because I'm in the, I'm in the same room. But if I were back home in Frankfurt, that'd be a silly thing to say. God is near to us, but we got to be hungering and thirsting for him. Groping for him, as it were, even though we can't see him. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Paul tells us that in Romans 12, 19. He's quoting Deuteronomy 32, 35. In fact, a major part of that whole 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy echoes that vengeance. <coughs> excuse me. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. It's not that, well, okay, Lord, I'll let you do it this time because I've calmed down some. No, it belongs to him. It's his possession. Vengeance is God's possession. The Bible says when he cleans house in the last days, when he comes to judge, the dead will be many. His sword will be dripping blood of all the unbelievers and naysayers. Hallelujah. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. Colossians 3, 17 and 25 is what's expected of all of us saints. Colossians 3... <coughs> Excuse me, I want to read that. <coughs> Let's start with 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly <coughs> in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's what we did earlier. That's why it's so important to have a praise and worship with real worship songs that are actual scripture. 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And he goes on about submission of wives and children, husbands loving their wives, etc., we got to understand this vengeance that it is something that's possessed by the Lord. He owns it like he owns everything else that exists. When we're vengeful, we take what doesn't belong to us and swing it like a sword. When we take vengeance, we take that which that we're thieves. Doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. When we take vengeance on our own, we have thieves from the Lord. What is so hard to understand about that? He says, vengeance is mine. End of story, period. Mm-hmm. Only the Lord can correctly dish out vengeance where it actually matters. It matters to the one being righted. It matters to the one being punished. <coughs> God's directive is to obey him. This includes all evildoers from the false gods of the nations, the disobedient divine spirits, down to and including all of humanity. Now we as holy ones, as saints, are to be submissive and allow scriptural truth and common sense to dictate our thoughts, words, and actions. It comes down to truth and sincerity. I try to mention it a lot. I've talked about it for years. Yes, inasmuch as it depends on us, we don't start a fight. Romans 12, 18. And Satan always stirs up a thing or two (coughs) against humans, especially Christians. Psalm 85, 10 says that mercy and truth have met together and righteousness and peace have kissed. That righteousness and peace go 
No, those are concepts. But they are in unison. Truth and sincerity, righteousness. Truth, sincerity. <coughs> Go together. And peace is part of that, isn't it? Be at peace, live at peace. When we hug one another or shake the hand and say, glad to see you here in truth and sincerity, we're also saying peace to you, brother. And that's what uh, salam alaikum is in uh, Arabic. And then the answer is peace to you back, basically. Peace. Peace, brother. Shalom, it's all tied to the same uh, concept of shalom, which is peace. Of course, there's a whole lot more to shalom. It means real peace. And anything that's not peace, it all automatically excludes the concept of shalom. There are, of course, circumstances in this world where we have no choice but to fight to save life and limb against evil and criminal attacks, for instance. But that's not what the Lord has for us in the first place. We've been very fortunate to, I've prayed all my life to be kept from, from evil, just like you know, God, uh, Jesus told them, uh, pray holy is your name. Let your kingdom come. Keep us from evil. See, it's all part of that. Keep us from evil. How do we keep from evil? To obey God. <coughs> when we obey Him, then we can resist the devil. When we resist the devil, evil stays away. Oh, there are times when it comes because our faith has to be tested. But that's again why when we stand with our helmet on, our breastplate on, our shield up, our sword in our hand, Woo! All that stuff. It all goes together. Are you hearing anything I'm saying? Yes. <clears throat> now the world looks at all of this as only one thing, and that's control. An insistence to be in charge over other people, and so to enslave them to whatever degree. And the drawbacks, the detriments, and side effects are sometimes not easily recognized, but are in fact solidly in place. Every action will have a consequence. It's called not being able to see the forest for the trees. Now obviously, authority comes with position and status. But nevertheless, the wielding of that authority must come down from the known word of God. You as a parent... Your authority over your children is most certainly in place, but if it's not coming down from, <coughs> from what's contained in the Word of God, we're doing our children a disservice, including ourselves, and we'll see it later in life. The consequence comes later in life, usually. So in as much as the Word is Jesus, the Yeshua Logos, who himself is our wisdom, this wisdom is already part and parcel of every single biblical teaching. No wonder we're to follow the Lord. It's already full of wisdom. I don't have to read the Word of God. I don't have to read this and then say, I wonder, how can I find wisdom in that? No, reading this, I'm reading wisdom. Reading anything in the Word, this whole thing is wisdom. Not just chapter 8 of, of the Psalms and whatever else, wherever else it's found. The whole thing is wisdom. King David said so, and he should have known, and he did know. So we're wise, and we not only know about this wisdom, but actually do what the wisdom, Christ Jesus, the living word, commands. James 1, and 25. Oh, I got to read that. Go to James, if you got a quickly, if you got a quick Bible there. <coughs> so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to speak, slow to speak, slow to speak, slow to speak. 
and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. No wonder God said, I will repay. If you repay, it won't be righteous according to my standard. I got to do it. Vengeance belongs to me. Why? Because it's righteous. It's awesome, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Verse 21. So because this wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God, therefore lay aside the, all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive the meekness, with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. you got to be a doer of the word. Oh, it's not about works. It's about faith. <laughs> no, it's about works. It's always been about works. Just not your own works. So it's most important in how we treat each other as fellow holy ones in the family of the Lord God, isn't it? So in here, during Sunday service worship, we have entered literal holy ground. You are on holy ground, whether you understand it or not. And that's for the duration of the service in this particular building. In order to honor, revere, and fear our Lord Yeshua. Worthy is the Lamb. When the creatures in heaven sing, worthy is the Lamb. To open the scrolls, the only one worthy. Worthy is the Lamb, period. He died for the sins of mankind. Worthy is the Lamb. Wow. Worthy is that sacrifice. He was a sacrifice. And the only thing you and I are asked to sacrifice is the fruit of our lips. That's a sacrifice to him, to pray, sing praises to him because of everything I just said and much, much more. I'm almost not done. What? I'm almost done. I know some of you are antsy. And notice I said service in here, <coughs> regularly scheduled and consecrated time set aside. We serve the Lord with the fruit of our lips in songs and praise and expounding and meditating on his word augmented by prayers and supplications. That in a nutshell is what a Sunday service is. So consequently, any and all personal issues that do not need immediate spiritual attention are to be left outside this realm for the duration of the service. It is the Lord's time exclusively, just like vengeance is his exclusively. Honor, glory, praise is his exclusively. <coughs> Are we getting some of this? Yes. We need to fear and revere him exclusively. And so whatever this means on a personal level, we must lay ourselves aside so the corporate body of Christ stays in unison during this official service. So having said all that, let's strive to be continually better of being in charge of our lives as we're commanded to be and taking the responsibility for our words and our actions, for we are Christ's ambassadors. Surely the Lord will bless that. Amen.